Hey everybody, today we are debating whether or not science points to theism, and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for this epic debate, as we have two guests here today, and we are very happy to have them. They have their links in the description, as well as Tom has his in the order, as always, request. You know, very specific guy. We love them, but we love both of our guests. We appreciate them being here. Thanks for your patience as well, as we had a slight uh, slight delay. (laughs) We are pumped to have you. Want to let you know, if this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button, as we're trying to build an eclectic community, and we want to hear all perspectives. Also, it'll give you a chance to get reminders of when we have future debates coming up. We even have one tonight, so that'll be really interesting. Yes. We will have a Christian and a fellow Christian debate on whether or not the Christian perspective can incorporate aliens with an atheist guest interlocutor who will be asking questions. So with that, we will now start up the open discussion as we will usually, as always, let the affirmative give a starting little opening, and that's untimed, so just as long as they think that they need to take to give their position. And then from there, just move right into the open conversation. If you would like to ask a question during the discussion, feel free to shoot it into the live chat. I will pull those questions out. And then, oh, uh, super chats. What we will do is, if you have a super chat, it can also be a comment that you make toward one of the speakers that they would get the chance to make a response to during the Q&A. And it also goes to the very top of the list for the Q&A. So with that, very excited to have these two here. Travis, we will let you get the ball rolling, just giving kind of that opening uh, kind of introductory statement on what your thesis is. Thanks for being here. Okay, uh, well, thank you, James. Uh, my name is Travis. Uh, I've been a Christian for about two years. I'm what they call a theistic evolutionist, and I adhere to uh, what you call mainstream science. And so would you like me to go ahead and begin my opening statement? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So to begin, I I think it should be noted that uh, the scientific consensus on models like loop quantum gravity, uh, quantum field theory, string theory, and and these are the scientific consensus is right now we don't know. So any proposition of these models at this time is in the realm of speculation. Okay. So what I would like to focus on is the universe itself, such as, and Tom, you, uh, I'd like to get into this more uh, during the discussion is the one in a billion asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Then dependent upon this, we have to have the exact precision we have in the strong and weak nuclear force constants, gravitational force constant, electromagnetic force constant, the ratio of the the electromagnetic force to the gravitational force, ratio of protons to electrons, electron to proton mass, and especially the precision in the cosmological constant. I'd say to get into this a little bit further, a good example, Uh, is of the strong nuclear force. Okay, so if this force were too weak, multi-protein nuclei would not hold together. Okay, in that case, hydrogen would be the only element in the universe. Now, on the other hand, if the strong nuclear force was even slightly greater than what we observed in the cosmos, protons and neutrons would have such an affinity for one another, they would not remain alone. They would all find themselves attached to other protons and neutrons. And in such a universe, there would be no hydrogen, only heavy elements. Now, as we all know from basic chemistry, life would be impossible without hydrogen. In the case of the weak nuclear force constant, if it were any stronger than what we observe, then the universe's matter would be quickly converted into heavy elements. Likewise, if any weaker than the elements, the universe's matter would remain in the form of just the lightest elements. Either way, essential life elements like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus would either not exist or would exist in ratios uh, too, too extreme for molecules to be built. So at, at whatever level we examine the building blocks of life, like electrons, nucleons, atoms, or molecules, uh, the physics of the universe must be meticulously fine-tuned and to focus on the cosmological constant. If the universe expanded too quickly, matter would disperse so efficiently that none of it will be close enough to form galaxies. And if no galaxies, obviously no life. Okay, so if the expansion rate expanded too fast after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself. So essentially, without such precision, we wouldn't even have a universe at all. Now, the dark energy density must be even more finely tuned. 
the original sources of dark energy must be at least 122 orders of magnitude larger than the amount astronomers now detect. This implies that somehow the sources must cancel one another so as to leave just one part in 10 to the 122, which is probably one of the most extreme uh, examples of fine tuning. In fact, this is even uh, endorsed by uh, atheist Lawrence Krauss. And also, I think it's important to note that fine tuning is not limited to the physical uh, constants of the universe. When we look at Earth itself, we see that the late heavy bombardment period, late tectonics, volcanism, even hurricanes and natural disasters must be precisely as they are for life to be here. Uh, okay, so anything, another thing I would like to focus on probably is the greenhouse gas removal. So in the erosion process, water from rain, streams, and mist catalyzes the chemical reaction between silicates and atmospheric carbon dioxide. The end products are silicon dioxide and carbonates. So to get the necessary amount of exposed silicate, efficient plate tectonics must build up islands and continents. The rate of silicate erosion depends on the seven factors of Earth's rotation rate, the average global rainfall, average global temperature, the chemical composition of Earth's atmosphere, and the total area of Earth's land masses, also the average slope. Okay, so after that, we got organisms like photosynthetic plants, bacteria, and a methane-consuming bacteria known as methanogens which take carbon dioxide, water, and methane from the atmosphere, and chemically transform them into sugar, starch, uh, starches, fats, proteins, carbohydrates. Now, if any of these get buried by erosion, plate tectonics, or other phenomena before they decay or get eaten by other organisms who then get buried before they decay, then greenhouse gases are converted into biodeposits through physical and chemical processes operating in the Earth's crust. So fine tuning the removal of these greenhouse gases to compensate for the increase in solar luminosity requires the fine tuning of all seven factors that govern silicate erosion, plus all the factors that govern the abundance, diversity, growth, decay, extinction, and burial of organisms. Now all this must be finely tuned in time throughout the past three and a half billion years. So I would say that this continual fine tuning over such an extended period of time challenges any reasonable naturalistic explanation that Tom will be able to offer. And it would also indicate that there is a causal agent behind Earth's life that anticipated in intricate detail the future physical and chemical conditions of the uh, sun and the Earth. Such a degree of fine tuning shows a clear intentionality for advanced life. And as we know, states of intentionality are the product of a mind, which cannot be attributed to chance, naturalist pantheism, etc. Okay, now as a student myself, this gets constantly drilled into me is that we need to have a model with future predictability. And as such, if my conclusion is true, that there is an intelligent causal agent behind the laws of physics that intended for life to be here, as time goes by, we're gonna to expect to find more and more evidence of finely tuned characteristics. Now, if naturalism is true, as time goes by, we would expect to find less and less evidence of fine tuning. Uh, in, in fact, there's a study, some research that I've done, it's very interesting, that uh, in our solar system alone, what were two perimeters in 1966 grew to eight by the end of the 1960s, to 23 by the end of the 1970s, to 30 by the end of the 1980s, and to 100, 123 by 2000. And I have an interesting quote here based on all this from Dr. Francis Collins. There are good reasons to believe in God, including the existence of mathematical principles and order in creation. They are pos positive reasons based on knowledge rather than the default assumptions based on a lack of knowledge. Now, since this is a scientific debate to which Tom agreed, he will need to provide a model which shows atheism is more probable and that this quote is indeed false. Thanks. All right. So. Um You said essentially what your argument seems to be it's improbable, therefore God. Is that right? Uh, no, actually, actually, Tom, well, the, the improbability is a very small factor. What I'm saying is that if naturalism is true, as time goes on, we're going to find less and less evidence of the fine tuning. Why? And I would, there's no yeah, naturalism. We stop, stop. Nothing in naturalism indicates that. Why would you even say that? Naturalism has no statement on that at all. What I'm saying, Tom, is that if uh, Christianity or uh, theism is indeed true, 
As time goes by, this is a testable, predictable model that we're going to be able to see more and more evidence of the fine tuning as time and research go on. And that is indeed what is happening. That has nothing to do with either theism or naturalism. Fine-tuning is just things are improbable, okay? So things are improbable, but that could be explained by design or by random chance or by determinism. That doesn't indicate anything. So as far as I can tell, your okay. things are improbable, uh, therefore I'm so God. Uh, I'm sorry, Tom, you're quite wrong. If I, can, if I can show evidence that as time goes by, these factors increase with time and no. research, that shows that probability and all these factors, in fact, there's over like 1,200 factors that must be precisely as they are for life to be here. That okay, shows none, of that, none of that indicates God. You're not understanding here. So if I can show the sun no, will rise I'm tomorrow. Okay, so I, I'm going to. Forgive me. I, I hate to interrupt you, Travis. I promise I'll let you have a response back. I just want to oh, okay. make sure that Tom has adequate time to give his kind of initial reaction, and then we'll come back and comments. So fine tuning is just improbability. It's improbable something will happen. So if we see an event like there's a one in a million chance of it happening, you're going to call that fine tuning because it's one in a million. But guess what? That one in a million could be like a coin right on its edge. There's like a 50% chance of heads and a or 50% chance of tails with a 0.00001% chance it lands on its edge. So it's a one in a million occurrence happening. But if we have a dice with a million sides, any side it lands on is a one in a million chance of occurring. Both of them have the same probability. Now, you could say if we found a coin landing on its edge in the middle of a table, we'd say that's probably designed. A human probably did that because one of them is significantly more unlikely than the other one. But on a dice, they all have the exact same probability, all one in a million. And it could be the case that uh, if you have a dice with two of the sides filed together, that side will have a probability of one and a half a million because it's two in a million but that is more likely than any of the other possibilities so just saying something is unlikely tells us nothing about whether it's designed or caused by random chance or caused by determinism so all you've said is improbable therefore god which does not follow because the improbability can also be explained by random chance like the dice with a million sides landing on any side or it could be explained by it being the most likely case like a dice with two sides filed together so nothing you've actually said indicates design at all. You just said their stuff is improbable. Like, okay. Okay, uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, but with all due respect, I am going to have to remind you that this is a scientific debate. So philosophical personal objections are absolutely meaningless. Now, what I would like to do is quote some pretty prominent physicists who disagree with you, as it were. Okay, so to quote Freeman Dyson, the more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known that we were coming. Okay, astrophysicist Paul Davies states, it seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. Also, he says, uh, the impression of design is overwhelming. In fact, uh, even Lawrence Krauss concedes with, with regard to the cosmological constant, it would require the most extreme fine-tuning in the universe. Right, I agree with all that. Fine tuning does not mean design. Fine tuning is just, it's improbable. So again, none of that indicates a God. None of that indicates there was a designer. <laughs> okay, Tom, this is a scientific debate. So you're gonna need to prevent, to produce evidential data that refutes my position. You I specifically just like you did. So I can debate. quote a physicist, Nima Arkani Hamad, who says, like most physicists, I'm an atheist because most physicists are atheists, which means nothing in physics the majority consensus in physics is that no, this does not indicate design. So if you want to give quotes, huh? my side wins. Now, to go back to the math and the physics, no, no, like no. I said, no, again, this is objective fact. Most physicists are atheists. Done. Over. So your quotes are done. <laughs> now, going back to the math and the science, none of it indicates design. All you've said is that there is some improbable thing, and you've assumed that it indicates design. Improbability does not indicate design, as I proved with my analogy with the dice. It could be design, or it could be chance, or it could be determined. So improbability does not indicate theism. You've made this silly assumption that because it's improbable, therefore God, there's nothing that correlates those two. You need to actually show that. That's a part of the scientific argument. You would have to actually show that the improbability indicates design as opposed to natural random chances or determinism. You can't just assume that. That's not science. Okay, so... It, essentially, you're saying that most physicists are atheists? Correct. Uh, just a quote from Nima Arkani Haman, like most physicists, I'm an atheist. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, actually, you know, that, that's pretty interesting. You would mention him. Uh, in, in fact, his argument from digital physics could be very compatible with theism. But yeah, you there, can, there's a problem. Compatible with theism, make stuff up. But no, like most physicists, he's an atheist. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, I've seen different, you know, uh, polls like Pew Research has said that uh, 51% of physicists believe in a god of some kind. Some have said two thirds. Some have said only 37%. Uh, however, that's quite irrelevant. I mean, look at look at the agnostic agnostic position, like Roger Penrose. No, no, I mean uh, that, was, that was kind of Please the point I was going for. No, I apologize, just to interrupt. That was kind of the point I was going for. All of your quotes are irrelevant. None of those are evidence. So I can just give more quotes. That was kind of the point. So go back to the evidence. Uh, okay, Tom, uh, can I finish what I was saying? Go for it. Okay, that evidence. Your statement about the majority of physicists being atheists and so forth. First of all, I would like to see some kind of evidence for that. Uh, some, you know, if you could provide a source, that would be fantastic. But even even with that being said, that's simply irrelevant. We have prominent scientists on both sides of the fence, and in fact, with you appealing to the atheism of certain science, it, it's a little self contradictory to your own position as a philosopher. And in, in fact, like Stephen Hawking said, philosophy is dead. It's kind of funny. Sean Curry said that you could put three I apologize, philosophers. I apologize, in. I apologize for interrupting again. Again, I already granted this. The quotes aren't evidence. That was the point. The reason I gave that quote was to show that your quotes are totally irrelevant. I agree with you. The consensus is not evidence here. Just saying that they, lots of people believe it, either on our side or, our, or your side or my side, it doesn't matter. I agree. To, Go to, to the hear, evidence. Just to hear, Again. Just to hear, Tom, you're, you're making the, these personal objections. You're providing no scientific data. I, I'm a little disappointed. You knew this was going to be a scientific debate. No, no, I already, so presented, you need to I already present, presented the evidence. Excuse me. You need to present a competing model that no, will show that my evidence is, in fact, false. No, I don't. That's You don't it's need really a competing good. model. You hold the burden of proof. You're making the positive claim. I don't need to show anything. Uh, no, sir. This is, a scientific, no uh, this is a scientific debate, and we share an equal burden of proof to present competing models. Wrong. That is not how science works. You're misrepresenting science. If you if you make a theory of Tom, you don't even know you, you no 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 stop, you're making stop, stop, you're simply stop, stop. okay you're making science. philosophical objections the scientific data that that shows a, a no complete not, lack no of this is basic science. science this is just basic science if you present something you have to show evidence well, for it, it. I don't have to present an alternative no alternative is required on my yes, part yes, at all yes Tom you you do if no I, I don't that's to, not science that's wrong. OK, do not. I do not ever need to. OK, Tom, I, I'm getting a little bit irritated. You're quite frankly, you're being very irrational. Now, I need you to present a scientific model. No, that you, would don't. you don't understand own. science. Stop. Science does not require. You to know, that's a common default basic. of yours. Whenever yeah, somebody disagrees, whenever yeah, somebody disagrees with you, you, you say they just don't understand. It's completely fallacious. Stop. Just stop. You, know, you need Nowhere to do a little bit better and present Guys, a model. Not an argument. Maybe. No, I hate, I hate interrupting. No, I, I'm I sorry, appreciate. Tom. You're not presenting a I, scientific guys, argument. Guys, okay, hold on. Please don't make me view you, I, either of you. Uh, we appreciate your passion. So there's nothing worse than a boring debate. I promise you that. So I'd rather it be like <laughs> this than once in a great while we have people come on and debate things where I'm like, it doesn't even seem like they care. So, but if you could do me a favor, just so it doesn't get too out of control. Uh, just keeping in mind to try to let remember that we'll we'll definitely let each of you get a response. Oh. I promise that. So, um, with that, is there a point? Maybe maybe we'll circle back to this one. Is there a, another point that we could discuss as like one of the main pillars for your argument, Travis? Well, no, no. I, I this this is a crucial point. Science does not ever require you to present an alternative hypothesis. All of the burden okay, rests well, on the person. No, stop, on stop. Don't interrupt. Here. Don't interrupt. Science does not <laughs> ever require you to present an alternative hypothesis. If you make a theory like phlogiston and you want to say that heat is some new particle that's released on when things burn, you need to show evidence for that. I don't ever need to present an alternative. Never. Never does that need to happen. You need to present evidence to support your case. Now, my main oh. argument here is that you are saying something is unlikely, therefore design. That does not follow. I can prove that with a simple mathematical analysis. It's improbable. The improbability of a coin landing on its edge is one in a million. Is that design? Sure. Could it be, des could you be explained by random chance? Can you get a one in a million event occurring by random chance? Yes, you can. Can you get a one in a million event occurring by probability and design? Yes, you can. So does improbability indicate design? No. 
because it can be random chance or determined. Neither. So mm. your assumption, your fundamental assumption is that improbable, therefore must be designed is false. I just proved it false because the improbability can be explained by random chance. All right. We'll go back to Travis just to be sure that uh, we have that back and forth volley. Travis, do you have a rebuttal ready? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, okay. So Tom's given this analogy of rolling the dice, et cetera. The problem with that is the number of factors which must be connected in order for life to be here. So it's not a simple rolling of the dice or one or two things. We're talking over 1,000 features that have to be precise and come together. And I would say that with all of these, it's a clear intentionality that life was, that the universe was designed for life. And there are several physicists who agree with me. Okay, can, can you give me a number? Just give me a number. What just the probability of life? Doesn't it doesn't need to doesn't need to be accurate. Just give me a number. Okay, well the the strong nuclear the strong and weak nuclear force constant, or I know over one in a billion. That okay, they must be go, precisely let's, as they let's are. Go with that one. One in a billion. Okay, we can get one in a billion. We have a coin with a width of it, one. It, well, it's actually quite significantly. It doesn't over. matter. The number does not matter. It's completely irrelevant. So sure. we're gonna it just we go with one in a billion. Now I can get a run in a billion probability by making a coin with a, a surface area of this edge of one in a billion. So the coin mm -hmm. landing on its edge has a chance of one in a billion. I can make a dice with a billion sides and every single side has a chance of one in a billion. I can make a dice with two billion sides, file two of the sides together, and the chance on that side will be one in a billion. So the, the chances are equal in all three cases, but in one case like the coin, it's the least likely outcome. In the case of the dice, it's exactly the same as every other outcome. And in the case of the, the dice that has two billion sides, it's the most likely outcome. So it could be that probability of one in a billion, and this applies to any number you give, it doesn't matter what number you give, the probability of that is the, the same in everything examples. The designed example like the coin, the random example like the dice, or the determined example like the dice with the two shaved sides. So you've made this faulty assumption that somehow the big number indicates the first example but not the other two even though they have the exact same numbers in all three cases okay well tom uh, I, i'm sorry there's just a great number of physicists that, that disagree with you and the problem i, I want to address with that analogy is that it's not just a roll of the dice of say the strong nuclear force constant or the, the weak nuclear force constant it's over 1,000 features in our universe and in our uh, solar system and planet that must be precisely as they are. These over 1,000 dices must be precise and connected in order for us to be here. Now, I'm saying that that shows a, a case of intentionality. Now, uh, you personally or philosophically disagree with me, and, and that's fine, but you've presented no scientific data to, to refute that. Okay, so going back, remember, I gave a quote from a physicist that disagrees. So quoting physicists... Well, I, I have a quote from physicists that do agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. That's why I gave it. The quotes don't matter. So saying you have a quote isn't evidence. You can just stop saying that for the rest of the day because it'll never be evidence. Hey, you know what? Don't, don't, hey, you know what? don't talk to me like that, Tom. I'm, I'm serious. No, no, I'm serious. You need to hear it because it's the truth. Now, going back to my example... Tom, you know nothing about science. All you can do is make personal objections you're presenting no no evidence to the contrary. No, no, no. I know a significantly more than you do on this, which you've just demonstrated. Oh, of course, of course now, you do, Tom. Let's go back to do. the argument. Let's go back to the argument. <laughs> so again, you said there's lots of different factors. It's not just one dice. Now, if you have two yes, dice uh, with six, a thousand. Great. So if you have two dice with six sides and you roll them both, that's the same as rolling one dice with 36 sides. So any number you give, you can represent it with one dice. You just make it a bigger number. So that doesn't work. So it doesn't matter how big the number is, you can make any number of any size. You can represent it as a coin with the width of that size, one in a billion, or a dice with a billion sides, or a dice with two billion sides and two of the sides filed together. Each of these have the exact same probability. It doesn't matter what number you use. You can make it as big as you want, one in a billion, trillion, trillion, trillion. You're gonna get the same thing. No matter how unlikely it is, it could be explained by design. It can be explained by random chance and it can be explained by determined causes. So no, just saying big number does not indicate design. That's the problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not simply saying big number, therefore design. I'm saying big numbers connected over with over a thousand uh, different 
perimeters, a thousand different uh, features that must be precisely fine tuned. So yes, I, I don't see that applying because there's a, a, a connection between each one. They have to be precise themselves and precisely connected. Remember, remember my two dice example. If you have one, two dice that have six sides and you roll them, whatever chance you get is one. So if you're not going to present any scientific evidence, what what would you like to discuss? Again, I, this is scientific evidence. You're not understanding it. That's kind of the problem. Mm -hmm. So again. Yeah, uh, uh, of course, matter, Tom. All you said is big number, therefore design. That's your entire argument. Big ar big number design. That's your argument. No. That's the problem. It's not. Uh, I can uh, I can prove that false in like five seconds. Big number does not equal design. Okay, Tom. Uh, I would like to know scientifically how you would explain the greenhouse gas removal under a strictly naturalistic process. Can we do that? Could be determined or could be random chance. Explain. I don't need to. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, goodness. And I covered this. Okay. I don't need to present any alternatives at all. You hold the burden of proof. And I just uh, your no, argument. sir. Uh, you, we're, this is competing models. I made that nope. clear before nope. the debate, and now you've gone back on your word, and that's fine. I, I didn't expect too much. But I was wondering if you could describe. No, no, no. I, whoa, whoa, whoa. I never said that. I never said competing models. Stop. I never. No, no, no. I'm, I'm no you called me a liar. Time. You called me a liar. I got to correct this. I never yeah, said anything yes, about competing yes, models. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not calling you a liar. However, in this instance, uh, you, you're you being very dishonest. No, 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 in that no, no, you no. specifically I agree so I to a scientific to debate. And to yes. So I agree to a scientific debate. Nothing in science ever says you have to present a competing model. That is not in science anywhere, ever. Did, this, was, this was in the uh, Facebook messages that we communicated with, and you specifically agree. Now, no, uh, okay. No. What so are you talking about? Just, I agree uh, to a scientific debate. Nothing in science says you have to indicate competing models. That's not uh, okay, a part of Tom, so from naturalistic processes, how do you account for the rate of silicon erosion that depends on the seven factors, you know, of Earth's rotation rate, global rainfall, global temperature, and so forth? How do you explain that from a natural process? Could be random chance, could be determined. Finally, that's just tuned for the increase in solar luminosity throughout the last 3.5 billion years. Explain that naturally. Chance. Could be random chance, could be determined. Oh, goodness. So you have no scientific rebuttal, just it could be random chance. I just rebutted your entire argument. You've just lost. <laughs> Tom, you lost. You can't even present any scientific data. That's because I just destroyed your argument in the very first No, step. Tom, you to just destroyed else. your own intellectual position. This is this is pretty simple. If you say there is one option, th this thing is evidence of this other thing. Remember my box analogy? If you have a box that weighs two pounds, you don't oh, know. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's please get into that. Yeah, because you don't understand that. So if you have a box, well, you you weighs, if you have a box, it weighs two pounds. Is that evidence yeah. of a rabbit? No, because it could be a lizard or a coffee mug or a weight. So we have some big number. If you don't know how mm -hmm. interconnected the big number is, you can make it a bigger number mm -hmm. if you want. That same big number could be explained by design or chance or determined forces, which means it's not indicative of design, just like the two pounds isn't indic indicative of a rabbit. This is really simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where I would disagree with you on that, Tom, is I would say that science opens the box, takes measurements, looks, and determines what it is. And what I'm saying is that as time goes by and we see these factors increase and increase for the anthropic principle, it is evidence indicative of design. Now, if naturalism were true, we would expect to find less and less finely tuned no, no. perimeters that, that's as time part, and research that's goes on. This is the part I'm asking about. Nothing in naturalism says that. Like, where are you getting this that naturalism somehow says it's not going to be fine tuned? Like, there's because, nothing that says that. Because as evidence goes by, if we do find more and more and more features, would you agree that it is evidence of the anthropic principle and fine tuning? The anthropic. Or would you just simply say it's chance? The anthropic principle has nothing to do with God. I don't know why you're using it in that context. So the fact that we is find the finely tuned perimeters in the universe for life to be here. Yes. And I would say that's indicative of design. And there are a lot of physicists who agree, which, you know, you want to accept. I've already covered that argument. That argument is done. So going back, <laughs> the anthropic principle just means that we have Tom, to. You're, no, you know what? Hold on one second. We just got to give Tom a chance to respond here. So the anthropic mm -hmm. principle just means we have to account for the fact that all the parameters need to be this way to account for life. Now, I agree with that. So the anthropic principle is a real thing. Does it indicate design? No, which I just proved. 
the same thing can be explained by chance or design. And I actually have lots of quotes from physicists like Stephen Hawking explaining this, but I don't need to present that because you haven't granted the very first most obvious premise of the entire <laughs> debates. This can be explained without design. So how is this indicative of design? You said, well, because if we find more fine tuning things, that's indicative of design. And if we find less fine tuning, that's indicative of naturalism, but none of that follows. Naturalism says nothing about whether or not there's going to be or not going to be fine tuning. So. I don't have nothing you've said is actually evidence. You've just asserted big number, therefore design. Well, Tom, I'm rather impressed that you've uh, debunked all these uh, physicists that agree with the fine tuning and you without even presenting any scientific evidence. Huh? That's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. I can just present quotes of other atheists or other uh, physicists who are mostly atheists. I mean, if you want to present quotes, I can present more quotes that cancels each other out. Not a good argument. So Tom, we have, like, we've gone over this. We have prominent scientists on both sides. And I would like to see a source because I, I've seen so many different polls uh, about, you know, what physicists believe. However, that's irrelevant to the evidence. Exactly. And you can why I told you this. No I'm giving quotes. Tom, I haven't finished. Okay. You can present no contradictory uh, evidence scientifically. You're making a personal philosophical objection, which in science is utterly meaningless. You need to present some kind of scientific evidence, and you're saying you can't do that or you won't do that. So, uh, you know, where do you want to go from here? No, again, you presented no evidence. All you said is here is a scientific fact. Like, yes, there is fine tuning. Agreed. Is that indicative of design? No, nothing. In, nothing. There's no connection between fine tuning, therefore design. That's the problem. You just no, th that. that's just that, that's just your personal view. Uh, I'm sorry, that's ad hoc. You need to present some kind of evidence that would debunk the fine tuning. Not talking about dice, I mean scientifically. No, 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 no. Again, so your entire argument is big number, therefore design. And I'm saying, how do you get from big number to design? I can say big number, therefore random chance, or big number, therefore determined. So how do you show actual design? You. you haven't told me anything. You just said big number, therefore design. How do you explain it? How do you explain the connection? Thank, thank you. Okay, what I've said is uh, with regard to big number design, is that when we have over a thousand features, once again, you know, I've covered this, that must be precise in their precision and connected to one another in order for life to be here, I'm saying that that's indicative of design. In fact, everything in our universe must be exactly as it is for life to be here. Now you're saying that's random chance. And I would say it's more probable that uh, it's an intentionality, a state of intentionality. So again, if we were saying that simply it's improbable, therefore design, then the universe is probably designed for astatine because they need to be more fine-tuned for astatine than they do for life. So I'm going mean, back to my example, uh, <laughs> as, so going back to my example, like it doesn't matter how many interconnected things you have. It's all still big number. Like if I, if I roll a bunch of dice, a bunch of six-sided dice, that's the mm -hmm. same as rolling one dice with lots of sides. They're the same thing. So mm -hmm. saying you have lots of interconnected things, like a thousand interconnected dice, that all need to line sixes or whatever, is the exact same as rolling one big dice with lots of numbers. Those are the same thing. So you, you've just gone back into my analogy, big number, therefore design. How do you get from big number to design? Like I've said, with the interconnectedness and the extreme probability that you're mentioning, I would say it's more reasonable that it's indicative of design. Do you, you know what a uh, fallacy is? Tom, let me, can I ask you something? Sure. Okay. Are you aware of what would happen if we didn't have the precise decay of the proton? <sighs> life, would, life would literally be terminated by the release of radiation, or we'd have insufficient matter in the universe for life. life Please would, account for the, this naturalistically. Chance or design, determined causes can both account for it. So again, so do you know what a gambler's fallacy is? Yes. So the probability it, of rolling six dice that all roll, roll sixes is the exact same as rolling six to the power of six or whatever, one dice with that many sides. Do you understand those loads are the same thing? Uh, Tom, I understand that you're presenting philosophy to science when we agree no, to a scientific science. debate. This, this is a scientific question. If we roll two dice with six sides, doesn't matter what they roll, the probability of that is the same as rolling one dice with 36 sides. Do you understand that? I understand what you're saying, yes. Okay, so if we have a thousand dice that all have a probability of one in a million, like you said there's like a thousand constants that all are all interconnected, they all need to roll the same thing, right? That's that's your position. Correct? Yeah, the same yeah, the, they have to be in in a precise uh, you know, and connected, yes, yeah. Correct, correct. So 
let's call all of those each individual things dice. And they all have a thousand okay. sides. And so if okay. we roll all of them and they all go sixes, that's the exact same as rolling one big dice with that many sides. Just multiply the number of dice to the power of the number of sides. And that in a dice with that many sides is the exact same probability. Do you understand that? Uh, yeah, and I understand. I, I don't have the, that much faith to, to believe in that, that great of chance. With the, with the interconnectedness, okay, okay, okay. I, so, I simply don't agree, Tom. Okay, so, so the probability is the same, which means if you have like a, a coin with the width of that, whatever it is, one in a billion, that mm -hmm. probability is the same as a dice with a billion sides landing on any side, which is the same as the probability of a dice with two billion sides and one side filed together landing on that side. So the fact that it's really improbable, like a big number, all of the thousands of things connected, it could be the least likely outcome by chance, like like a coin on a table. It's it's really unlikely that a coin just falling is going to land on its edge. So it's probably reasonable to infer the coin was designed. Somebody deliberately put it on its edge. Or the probability could be explained by a dice with a billion sides landing on any side. So that's just random chance. It's just random exact chance. same probability mm -hmm. as any other outcome it could have had. No difference there at all. Or it could be like a dice with two billion sides and two of the sides filed together and it landing on that side, which is actually the most likely thing to occur by chance. If you have a two billion, mm -hmm. billion sided dice and two of the sides are filed together, that side is the most likely thing to occur by chance, without design, just by random chance. It's the most likely outcome. So one in a billion could be the most likely outcome to occur by chance without design. Okay, so, so the big number, there's a big number, the chance, the probabilities of things occurring, uh, all of the fine tuning we need to have in, big number, very unlikely, could be the most mm -hmm. likely thing to occur by chance because of the natural forces behind it. We don't know, could be the least likely, could be the most likely, could be exactly the same as everything else, we don't know. You seem to be saying, that it must be the least likely because you've assumed it to be. Therefore, it can only be explained by design. Big number, therefore design. Now, the big number could be the most likely thing to occur. For example, all of the boundary conditions could be interconnected by some undiscovered law of nature that we don't know about yet, actually making life the That's most true. likely thing to occur. Mm -hmm. So you've made the assumption, big number, therefore design, and that assumption isn't supported. Okay, uh, Tom. Do you think perhaps uh, we could agree, agree on this, that I'm saying that the evidence indicates design with all the factors and all the probability, and you're saying that you would rather go on, on the assumption that it's pure chance? And then no, we'll no, get I'm into saying, the same. So I'm saying that you believe it's design, and I'm saying it yes. could be design, or it could be chance, or it could be determined. We have no evidence one way or the other. That's my position. Okay, and it would be uh, determined by uh, undiscovered law, correct? Essentially, yeah. Okay, so the problem with an unders undiscovered law is, let's say we find an undiscovered law for complete naturalism, okay? We could also just as likely find an undiscovered law that points towards theism. So uh, as an argument against theism, that simply just doesn't work. That would mean it doesn't work in the other way, too. Like, right, they would cancel theory. each other out. Therefore, it's not a consistent argument. And Congratulations, we, 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 you now just understood my argument. Yes, yes, good job. That's, that's, yes, <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's the same oh, thing with the fine tuning, the same thing with the fine tuning. So instead of applying it to this hypothetical law we haven't discovered yet, now apply that exact same reasoning to the current fine tuning we know about, and you get my argument. Yes. No, what I'm saying is, is your argument is irrelevant because saying an undiscovered law that would cancel each other out. What I'm saying is what we can observe and what we do observe with all these perimeters over a thousand, once again, point to design. And okay, I'm saying that it points to design and you would no. rather go on, on the assumption that it's just pure chance. No, I, so, I've assumed it. So my question is, is how does it point to design? You keep saying fine tuning, big number, therefore design. And I'm saying, no, that could be explained by chance or determined processes. So how exactly do you get to the design thing? Like, Where's the evidence of the design? I'm saying that the evidence for design is more probable than the extremely, I'm sorry? How, how is it more probable? Like, how is it more probable? You're saying the fine, the, the to, this? Uh, okay, due to the astronomical, I mean, in, in science, anything, any uh, 
factor that's over 10 to the power of 55, I believe is considered absurd. And we would be well over that. I mean, the cosmological no, constant no. alone is, I mean, is 10 to the power of 122. So I'm apologies, saying it's more. Apologies. That. Um, that's not the case. One example would be we can get an electron from the Andromeda galaxy has a lower probability of getting to our eye than that number. So it would be absurd by what you just said. Nothing in science ever says that there's some magic number that anything beyond that is absurd. It doesn't happen. But but okay. again, so I mean, I still I want to clarify this. So your your position is is that big number therefore design. So we can get a big number like one in a billion. It doesn't the number doesn't matter. The one in a billion can be explained by design, but it can also be explained by chance, and it can also be explained by determinism. So you, your your argument is big number therefore design. It's somehow more reasonable to conclude design than random chance or determined processes. And I'm trying to figure out how because the big number on its own doesn't do that. Just big number doesn't indicate design. You need something else. Okay, you know what's interesting? Have you heard Hugh Ross's analogy about stacking dimes up uh, yep. to, to the moon and the probability would be, okay, you paint, you paint one red dime and you stack the coins up, dimes up to the moon. That's the same probability we get with this random chance you're mentioning of just a few factors. Okay. I'm saying I don't have that much confidence, Tom. I'm saying I, I, go, with, I go with design. That's what the evidence is pointing to. Again, you haven't you haven't explained how you said big number, therefore design, but the big number can be explained by chance or determinism. So I, I'm still not following your argument. How do you go from big number to design? <laughs> Tom, I'm saying, I'm saying it's more likely. I'm giving how? the probability. Explain, explain how it's more likely. I don't get it. Like, for example, if I if I gave you a number one in a trillion. Mm -hmm. Now, is it more likely that one in a trillion is a coin on its edge or a dice that landed on one side? or a dice with two trillion sides and two sides filed together, which is the most likely if I just tell you one in a trillion? Okay, okay Tom, that, that's not the point. That's not the point I'm getting at. That's what the point I'm, I'm getting at. Well, I, I don't care. I mean, you, you presented no no scientific rebuttal, just that's philosophical. Science, that, that is, that is you know, a scientific rebuttal. I'm sorry, that's complete nonsense, Tom. I, I, can you what? present any kind of evidence? Any, how, anything. how is that not? Any I, kind I'm, of not I'm not following. I'm not following here. So. I'm not understanding how that is an evidence. So, so right. So you have a big number. Now the big you're saying the big number, the improbability of all the laws is somehow indicative of theism. It's more likely to be explained by theism. That's your argument, right? No, Tom. Uh, you know, I, I want to go back to, to the dime analogy that you paint one red, you stack them up to the moon, and you find you you bl get blindfolded, you pick out that one red dime, as Hugh Ross has pointed out. That's the probability of just one factor. I believe the cosmological constant. Okay, big number. I grant big numbers. Yes, uh, I agree. Yes. So, so, but big number does not indicate design. So, so again, if I give you yeah, a big no, number, I'm sorry, Tom. I, I disagree with you. Uh, so again, that's your claim. You're claiming that it somehow does, and I'm asking you to explain how it does. So again, let's just go with any big number. Pick any big number, like Graham's number. I'm going on probability theory, Tom. That's, that's great. You still need to explain. No, how. Okay. Let me put it to you this way: oh. We can't know anything for sure in science. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know that. Yes. So I, I'm saying that there's there's pointers towards theism. I'm yeah. not saying we can prove it. I'm not saying that these uh, features are, are therefore theism. I'm saying that in my view, they are indicative of an intelligence that wanted life to be here. I agree. I'm not I, I, understand, that, I understand your argument. I'm trying to explain or ask you how. Like you keep saying there's indicators towards theism, but so far all you probability said, theory. Yes, I'm using probability theory, but the probability theory indicates theism no more than the other possibilities. So the three possibilities here are design, chance, okay. and determined. The three possibilities are design, chance, and determined. So far, the only evidence you presented is big number. Now, big number can be explained by all three of them equally. There's no difference in probability here. It's just 33, What's 33, the... 33. So where, where okay. is the... Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, what I'm trying to say, and, and this is it, okay, just bear with me, Tom, work with me. What I'm saying is that all these perimeters together that must be precisely as they are, they're contingent. They could have been anyway, you know, uh, and that they're in such a way as to permit life. I'm saying that's an evidential pointer towards uh, design. Well, one now, I'm not, not saying I, I'm not... I'm not I'm one, not one, playing, applying a God of the gaps or, or anything like that. What I'm saying is that the laws of physics themselves seem to be finely tuned for a desired result. So, so, so again, in first, that sense, are you, are you done? 
Let me know when you're done. Uh, well, just about what I was going to say is in that sense, uh, I would adhere to methodological naturalism with regard to the laws of physics. What I'm saying is that the laws of phys physics themselves seem to be indicative that uh, life was desired. Okay, so if I give you a big number, it doesn't matter how big the number is. The number can be explained by design, like a coin that someone put on its edge, or it could be explained by chance, like a dice with one, like a million, the, side, the number of sides of whatever number you pick, or I can pick a dice with twice the number of sides of whatever number you pick. So just saying big number could be explained by design or chance or determinism. Big number does not indicate any one of these more than the other. Like if I just say a trillion, is it more likely to be the coin the dice or the two times the two trillion sided dice like which one is the most likely if i just give you a number okay uh, you uh, let's go back to the hugh ross, hugh ross is analogy no, 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 let's let's what not let's answer that you're my pick question that red we need to stick to this you need to can answer, you, the can you answer that which is more likely if i give you a number it doesn't matter what the number is is it more likely to be a coin on its edge a dice with that many sides or a dice with twice as many sides and two sides filed together which is more likely given the number well Tom, i'm not gonna it's more than mere probability it's probability with an intention uh intentionality for a desired result and we see everything pointing to that result going back to I my mean, you gotta I, answer, I under, you gotta answer the question because this is the entire point if i give you a number it doesn't matter what the number is 10 could, could be it could be designed it could be I, intentional I, someone could have taken a dice with 10 sides put it on the 10. Someone could have taken a dice and rolled it and it landed 10. Someone could have taken a dice with two sides filed together that add to 10. So if I give you a number, 10, what's more likely, dice, coin, or dice with 20 sides? I would say uh, 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 the dice is that are, if they all line in such a row for a desired result, I would say that's a, a good indicator that, that it was intentional. Uh, Remember, uh, okay. Gamblers, and I understand remember, that you would rather go on chance. You know, no, you know, no, no I haven't it, said any. I haven't said chance at all. So again, if you, if you if you roll if you roll <laughs> ten dice, if we roll ten coins and they all land heads, that's the same as rolling a twenty sided dice and it landed on any number. Tom, can we talk power. about some more science instead of rolling it's dice? Science. I mean, it's seriously, all science. If you don't understand this, you don't understand science. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I only go to college. On, you know. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, yeah. It's pretty. It's required for science. It's so. So again, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. how many things you have in a row. If you have all like sixes, if you have a thousand dice with all sixes, that's the exact same as having one dice with a million sides. There's no difference. It's a gambler's fallacy. They are the exact same. Yes, so yeah. again. My question, which you still haven't answered, you've refused to answer because it completely undercuts your entire methodology. No, I'm, I'm saying it's irrelevant. More likely, if I give you a number, I can give you any big number you want. What's more likely? Was it a coin that someone deliberately put on its edge intentionally? Was it a dice with that many sides that just happened to roll in any one of its sides? Or was it a dice with twice as many sides which happened to roll on the one that was filed together? Which is most likely if I just give you a number? I would I would say uh, the number that okay let's so let's say the dime the, the dice and everything if the, if you give me a number and they all precisely go on that no, no, number no, no, this is, this is, there's not there's not oh, there's, there's, Tom please there's not uh, okay, there's, 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 no no there's no all there's no all just there's you're three going things back on your word no no no, there, no, no, there, no, no. There's, there's, there's goodness you're a mess the question there are three different things they are not connected in any way there is a dice on it there is there's only one of these is a possibility. They can't all three exist. There's only one. Either it's a coin on its edge, it's a dice with that many sides, or it's a dice with twice as many sides. It can only be one of them. There's no interconnectivity to it. It's just one of these three. Which is most likely if I tell you the number a trillion, one in a trillion? Okay, so what, what that in essence is saying that it, it's blind probability. Am I correct? No, no. So one of the, like the coin landed on its edge is designed. That's someone deliberately put the coin on its edge. That's design. One of them is just a dice with that many signs, which is chance. And one of them sure. is a weighted dice, which is determined. It's the most likely outcome. Those are the three possibilities. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm asking yeah. you, which of these three is most likely if I give you just a number, one in a trillion? Like how does it indicate okay. one more yeah. than the others? Tom, okay, I under, I understand what you're saying. What I'm saying is is that the number one to a thousand 
all, all essentially all you're doing is saying chance determinism or design correct yes okay and i'm i'm saying that the probability is greater with design and i've shown evidence yep. for that no no that's the part you haven't so you've said big number therefore design so you again oh, you still haven't gosh. answered my question you still have not answered the one question i've asked the entire time which is so simple and it makes you look terrible you got to answer the question which is more likely if i just give you a number one trillion is it more likely that it's the coin that someone deliberately put on its edge is it more likely that it was a dice that was rolled randomly or is it more likely that it was uh, a weighted dice what is more likely if i just give you the evidence one in a trillion which is more likely which yeah is the most let's, let's go with the one let's go with the one on its edge now uh, since i how? answered your question can you answer uh, a question about mine well how mine? how how is it more likely that it's the coin if it's on its edge, it would show intentionality because it's different than the others. Well, no, again, so it's it's one of these three. We don't know which one it is. We know all we know is there's one in a trillion. So we know that something mm -hmm. happened that has a probability of one in a trillion of occurring. One of the possibilities is a coin on its edge. Another possibility is a dice with a million sides. And another possibility is a dice with two million sides that's weighted. If I just tell you that some event happened that has a one in a trillion chance of occurring, which one of those three is more, more likely? Tom, did, uh, I want to know how this refutes fine tuning. Uh, uh, okay, uh, scientifically, I'm, not not dimes, not you know. I'm pretty sure it does. Pretty 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 obviously. I'm not sure how to explain this to you exactly. Yeah. But can can you answer the question? So again, I'm going to no tell uh, no. I'm sorry, Tom. You need to answer my question about the probability of finding a red dime. If all the dimes were stacked to the moon, that shows clear intentionality. Your philosophical or, or personal objections are utterly meaningless. You provided no scientific data, no competing model, even after agreeing to a scientific debate. My, my friend, I, I don't know what else to tell you. This is pretty simple. Like whatever the number you is, the, the dime analogy, give me a number. What is the probability? Just give me a number. Uh, let's just go with one in a trillion. One in a trillion. Okay, exactly. yes, one in a trillion. So I'm going to sure. tell you, an event occurred that has a chance of one in a trillion. A one in a trillion event happened. We don't know what it mm -hmm. is, but we know a one in a trillion event happened. Now, it could okay. be the case that somebody took a coin and put it on its edge. And the coin has a width of one in a trillion, so the chance of that happening is one in a trillion. Or mm -hmm. it could be a dice with a trillion sides that you rolled and it landed on any side. Because any side has a chance of one in a trillion of happening. Sure. Or it could be a dice with two trillion sides and two of the faces are filed together and it landed on that side, which was actually the most likely thing to occur by chance. So if I just tell you a one in a trillion event happened, which of these three is more most likely to be that one in a trillion event? You're wanting me to say either one. However, I'm not going to do that because, of, like I said, the, okay, the the one in a, in a trillion probability would have to be connected to another one in a trillion probability, to another and to another oh, over God. a thousand you times. No, no. 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 gambler's fallacy. We're gambler's fallacy. Uh, guys, uh, just to, we are going to move into the Q and A and just. Oh minutes. God! Want to let you know. Oh. It's, it's been a heated. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm sorry. You could prevent. No, you could present no scientific evidence. All right, Jeff. Well, uh, and points. We've got. Uh, a lot of questions, so we are excited to move into the Q&A. It's been an exciting one. We appreciate that you guys have got the energy and the passion, which is, like I said, I'd much rather it be late or, uh, let's say high energy rather than low. So we will now go to the Super Chats first. Uh, Don, oh, give me, Danny Peterson, thanks for your Super Chat. They said, to James and company for the good work and debates. That really means a lot. Thanks so much for your encouragement. Uh, second Best Bob said, Hey, James, your channel is fast becoming my favorite. You're welcome, everyone, which is so cool. Thanks so much, Second Best Bob. We're glad to have you here. It means a lot. Also, the Crawdaddy, Cody, he says, so I think this is he's coming after you, Travis. He says, oh. He says, Quoting people gets you nowhere. You just shift your assertion without evidence to someone else's assertion without evidence. What do you think of them apples, Travis? Ooh, okay. I would say, uh, as a student, since I haven't earned my degree yet, I have to stand on the shoulder of giants. 
Okay, I can't appeal to my own authority. I, I go with prominent scientists that I that I admire and that do good work. I'm sorry, uh, you disagree, sir. <laughs> Gotcha. He's, now he's coming after you with another jab, Travis. He says, Travis. Oh. So this is again is the Crawdaddy 029. says, Travis, what? seriously learn the science. What are your thoughts? Uh, okay, well, I, I presented several scientific factors like, you know, the correlation of the gravitational force constant to the electromagnetic force constant and I simply disagree with them that I don't know science. I know I know how the constants work. Uh, so I'm just sorry, Crawl Daddy doesn't like me. <laughs> well, not Next. really, but yeah. Next up, we appreciate those super chats. And next one is Blake Boyles. Thanks for your super chat. He says, "Keep on keeping on, buddy." Well, thanks, Blake. That means a lot. We really appreciate you being here. Next up, Pine Creek. Old friend Doug, <laughs> glad to see you, Pine Creek. He asks, question, could Yahweh change one of the fundamental constants of the universe and still create life? If so, how is that fine-tuned for life? Uh, n well, if he changed one thing, he we would have to have entirely different laws of physics. We wouldn't have carbon-based life. So... Says okay, next up, Pine Creek has another question for Travis. He says, what All scientific right. evidence What scientific evidence would Travis accept to conclude that there is no God? Okay, uh, so archaeological evidence of the body of Jesus, if we didn't have a Big Bang 13.79 uh, billion years ago, if the universe had been static, that would pretty powerfully go against what it says in Scripture. Gotcha. Next up, Dave Langer. Thanks for your question. He says, question for Travis. If you have a question, Good you jump. Travis, they love you. You've got a, you got a following. So if you have a question, we will put questions for a T jump. We will push those to the top in case anybody has them. Because we want T jump to get some action too. So I'm, I'm good. I'm good. He can, just, he can have all the questions. <laughs> Dave Langer says, Travis, could God have created the universe in a different way? Yes, he could have, but life as we know it wouldn't be the same. We would, uh, you know, like I said uh, to Pine Creek, there we would have no carbon-based life. So it, it, he would in, uh, have had to have had life. I mean, it would be totally different. So I think that he wants life the way it is. I mean, because that's the way it is. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Basically, that what we have now it was his intentionality. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Travis. Danny, yes, thanks for your question. He asked, why will Tom not answer? And it's Travis who needs to prove thing Tom believes in. Makes sense? Uh, Let's see. Let me just make sure uh, I uh, could you uh, clarify? What did I answer? I have no idea what I didn't answer. I thought I answered everything. I think there's more, there's, hold on one second. I think there's more than one question rolled in here. I just want to make sure that I keep that apart if there is. Uh, so they say, oh, okay. So they're saying, why will Tom not answer? And why is it that Travis needs to prove thing Tom believes in? Um, I think they're saying. James, James. Hold on. Well, I, I think second. he's saying, uh, why didn't Tom provide evidence? Maybe. No, I did. I provided proof, actually. I provided some proof. Oh, I did. I just... Uh, I, of I, course you did, buddy. Forgive me if you're out there, Danny. Um, I'm not exactly sure what part you were referring to. We might come back to that one. Mind Onion, thanks for your question. They asked, what step-by-step -step experiment can we perform to show that the universe is fine-tuned? The step by step would, as I mentioned to Tom, would be if time, you know, as time and research goes on, we find more and more perimeters that are exactly as they should be for life. And, and like I said, we're not going to have proof. You can't have absolute proof of anything, but we can have indicators and pointers. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Next up, mm -hmm. everyone needs a smile. 
Question for Travis. You said okay. minds could not emerge from purely natural means. Can you explain? No, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Gotcha. Well, they were going to ask if you could explain, but uh, it sounds like there might have been a misunderstanding. Uh, yeah, I never said, you know, in, in fact, you know, with regard to, you know, is consciousness the same as the brain and everything? I'm a little agnostic on, on, on that, so I don't really take a position either way. But I do think it's a little interesting that in his book, Many Worlds and One, The Search for Other Universes, uh, that Alexander Lincoln postulates that perhaps mind predated the universe. So, gotcha. Next, we just had a super chat fly in from none other than Sigifredo Sarabia. Glad to see you, Sigifredo. They asked, Tom Jump, let's give you the one in a trillion for a single event. How to, how do you explain the multiple events found in natural law without applying contingency? Uh, determinism, like you can do it without it, you can do it with a necessary thing. You just say, a necessary thing did these contingent things. So you can just ground it just like theists do in a god, just make it grounded in a naturalistic thing like naturalistic pantheism. Like There's no problem there. Ooh. I had a good rebuttal to his uh, naturalistic pantheism, but, you know. We can, we, if it comes up in another question, we may go over it, but just to get through as many questions as possible. Everyone needs a smile. Uh, we've got theirs. Thanks very much. Trevor Lund, thanks for your question. They asked for Travis, how have you falsified naturalism scientifically? Uh, you, I, you haven't, I haven't falsified naturalism scientifically. In fact, science works on methodological naturalism with regard to the study of a specific phenomenon. What I'm saying is probability-wise, we see more evidence of design than purely naturalism. Thank you very much. And we just had another super chat fly in from Subtracted. Thanks for your super chat, Subtracted. They ask, if the universe is so fine-tuned, why is it that most of the planets in the universe are uninhabitable and cannot support life? Uh, I'm assuming that's for me. Uh, actually, I, I think that, uh, in fact, shows a greater degree of fine tuning because for it would show that life was intended for Earth and not for other planets. And in fact, if we didn't have these other planets, if we didn't have the mass density and all these things that we have, life on Earth would not be possible. In fact, all these other planets, uh, you know what's special about Earth is with the magnetosphere, we see so much design in our planet and no other planets. Uh, I would say that, and then Life was intended for Earth. Gotcha. Everyone needs a smile. Question for Tom Jump. What scientific evidence could realistically be discovered that would point exclusively to the existence of God? Uh, so you're testable prediction. So you just say, like, if I believe there is a God and if the God exists, I can make a prayer to him and he will give me a golden brick. And that's a future testable, repeatable prediction that works repeatedly. That'll be evidence of a God. Thank you very much. Next up, Murdoch101. Thanks for your question. Question for Tom. Oh, snap. Tom coming at you. Saying, quote, it could be chance. Begs the question. Big numbers are relevant if fine tuning is very improbable under chance, but moderately probable under design. Fine tuning, prima facie, supports design. Oh, that's actually correct. But the problem is, is that there's no reason to believe that a god would design the world as it is now. You'd have to presuppose the properties of a god would conform to one that would make a world like this, as opposed to like an evil god who would make a world differently. And so the probability that the god who exists would be is equally as unlikely as the universe just popping out the way it is. You can just say it has as many variations as the universe. And so we just make stuff. It's just made up, essentially. The probabilities are the same, equally as random. I have a good rebuttal to that, James. You make it very snappy, Travis. Uh, well, uh, kind of snappy. Like fifteen seconds. Oh boy. Okay, so with regard to objections on godlike omni properties, maybe there's a greater god and, and so forth. An analysis of, of these kind of arguments, all Tom is doing is confirming that from our limited perspective of three dimensions in time, the nature of God would be unknowable, and I would agree. As the late Dr. Chuck Missler has stated, a God small enough for our own mind would not be big enough for our need. 
God would need to be the one to reveal himself to us, not vice versa. So that's absolutely no threat to theism whatsoever. Well, that had nothing to do with my point, so I mean, okay. Next up, we will go to this <laughs> incoming super chat from Sigifredo to Rabia. Thanks for your super chat. They said, no fine tuning? What's biological teleology science? Uh, who's the question for? Well, I never said there was. I agree there is fine tuning. I didn't say there wasn't, so. Oh, uh, okay. So you would concede it, but you'd maybe describe it or define it differently. Or say. Thomas, oh my goodness, how embarrassing. Thomas's internet appears to be struggling. I, Thomas, are you there? I, well, I sorry, I lost connection. What? No problem. So, so uh, you would say you wouldn't deny fine tuning, but fine tuning yes. is not evidence of design. Fine tuning is just the fact that there's a really big number. It's really improbable given the laws that we know about that life would come about because it can only exist on a small spectrum of possible combinations of constants. But no, fine tuning has nothing to do with design, which is why most physicists are atheists and it doesn't indicate design. No, they're not, Tom. We have well, great scientists on both sides. Why do you keep saying that? Yeah, I want to see a study sure proving. I just want to give them, forgive me, I'm sorry, Travis, just to make sure that the second question that they put in your super chat is, they, oh. said, they said, what's biological teleology science? So I think they're trying to say like, hey, Tom, uh, there's this branch of science that exists, and if you deny fine tuning, which you would say, well, I, you I don't. don't. So fine tuning does exist; it's just not indicative of a designer. So there's definitely biological teleology, but the teleology <laughs> comes not from a designer; it comes from evolution, natural Gosh. selection. Next, I, I, I agree with uh, just evolution. To get, yeah. Just to get through as many questions, forgive me, Travis. I promise I'll I'll try to give you more chances to respond. Just to try to get through as <laughs> one from each person. Mordak 101, thanks for your question. They said for Tom, saying, quote, it could be, ch oh, he did that one. Sorry, that's embarrassing. Phil H., thanks for your question. They said, the order of a deck, um, the deck of 52 shuffled cards is 8.06 times 10. I think they, they're saying to the 63rd power. Is that design? I think they're asking. Travis. Travis. Uh, okay. No, th that would not be designed because it, there's no, it, it would serve no function. You would have to get card after card after card after card to be indicative of design. One, no, there would be no evidence of design. Wait, so if, if the cards are all ordered by like ace, king, queen, jack, ten, or is that is that design? Uh, that's usually, it's usually put together by a, a person. So yeah, sort of. Uh, Next, okay, uh, okay, I won't even say it. I won't even say it. All right. Brag Nightwolf, thanks for your question. Yeah, I tell you what, this guy's really getting on my nerves. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, no, uh, it's kind of funny in a way, but yeah. Uh, you wear your emotions on your sleeves. We appreciate that. Very few oh, yeah. people will admit it. So, uh, Karak Nightwolf, thanks for your question. They ask, for Travis, does he know what a post hoc rationalization is, and does he not think that his fine tuning argument falls under post hoc? So yes, I, I know it's saying sort of after the fact. You know, you, you go back and look at it, and I would say no, that I'm not because that's just not where the evidence is pointing to, as far as it being post hoc, just rationalizing because everything in the universe is the way it is. For life, so no, I, I would just simply disagree. Gotcha. Second best, Bob, thanks for your question. They ask, can you ask Travis, is it possible that life became possible because of the universe, not that the universe was created for life? So I think they're maybe getting at the misanthropic principle, if I'm not mistaken. Like, yeah, could you repeat that, James? So they, yeah, they're asking, is it possible that life became possible because of the universe? rather than the universe having been created for life. Well, anything is possible. I would say it's unlikely. But that being said, uh, you know, I adhere to process structuralism, which is biological evolution, even the origin of life, through the fine-tuning. So do with that what you will. Gotcha. We got subtracted with the Super Chat. Thanks for that, Super Chat. He says, hey, Travis, why does God seem so imaginary? Because he is. 
<laughs> because uh, that's okay, your personal good. view of him. Now. Gotcha. Uh, okay, Tom. Tom, was he asking me or was he asking you, buddy? He's asking uh, you, Travis. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I would say that's a personal opinion, which would pose no threat to theism and is simply a, irrelevant. What you think? Sorry. Gotcha. Next up, Logo Fields. Thanks for your question. They ask for Travis. In the beginning, you quoted Stephen Hawking saying, "Quote: Philosophy is dead." But yes. Isn't he says, but isn't saying that theism is more likely, given fine-tuning, a philosophical position? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, he, he is correct. The reason I was stating uh, you know, what Stephen Hawking did is because when Tom was uh, appealing to the atheistic view of most scientists, that would undercut his position as an atheistic philosopher, because none of his philosophical arguments would work, because as Stephen Hawking said, philosophy is dead. I was using that as an example. Next up, Paul James, thanks for your question. I'm trying to kind of get everybody's first question in at least before we go to the second ones from uh, people, but we've just had a lot of come, a lot come in. So Travis, he says, for Travis, is 13.7 billion years a big enough number for a for Yahweh to create Adam? He says, sorry, Super Chat, not working for me. No problem with Paul. Thanks for your question. So uh, I can repeat that for you, Travis, if you like. I know it's yeah. scrappy. Yeah. Um, he says, Travis, is 13.7 billion years a big enough number for Yahweh to create Adam? Okay, well, I, I would say it, it would, wouldn't matter. If you have a causal agent of the, the Big Bang and the universe, uh, time would simply be irrelevant because it would be transcendent of the time that it created. So it could be long enough, it could be short, it would, simply wouldn't matter. Gotcha. Performance who? Thanks for your question. Glad to have you here. They say, <laughs> what's T-Jump's argument that science points to atheism or None. materialism, whichever you prefer? Well, we only have evidence of material things, so it points to materialism because we have evidence of material things, but it doesn't point to that it's the only possible thing. There could always be more stuff out there, so science doesn't say anything about that. My position of the atheism is that nothing indicates a god, so we should just assume it's imaginary, but nothing in science actually disproves a god. Gotcha. As I mentioned, trying to get to everybody's first question before we go to the second ones, as we've had a lot today. Iron Terrier Terrier, thanks for your question. He said, if an asteroid hit Earth tomorrow, would that be an example of fine-tuning? Design. Is that for me? Yes. Okay. Well, fortunately, we have Jupiter in our magnetosphere that that prevent a lot of that. That were, I would say, designed. But if one did, I would say that's pretty pretty good evidence that Earth is not designed. Gotcha. And I can see that. Yeah. Just because we have a we have a lot of questions, and I want to respect the debaters' time as well as that. I've actually got to get to a quick appointment by the end of the hour, hopefully. Want to mention we? Oh, did I miss the super chat? Sorry about that. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, want to honor those. We really appreciate your guys' support as we are trying to grow the channel. We are also trying to do a lot more in-person debates. We are planning. This is provisional. Like, uh, it's not a certainty yet, but we are planning on a small debate tour in Texas this January. Oh, nice. And. That would have a number of debaters that we are trying to reach out to to schedule in-person debates with. We Tom Jump's debate with Stephen Worthy was a people seem to love it. I definitely loved it. It was a lot of fun. And so we are looking to do more of those. And that your support of the channel helps us do that. Is that kind of helps cover expenses and kind of helps us get the bring debate to not only on YouTube but also on more. Kind of bring it to people's neighborhoods, you could say, whether it be you know, try to reach out to the Bible and beer consortium, and then uh, as well as the churches to just kind of get you know, that diversity, the, the diversity of views out there. So, I want to also mention we are very thankful as these debaters have had a lot of patience today in our technical startup. We are, we are, but we're getting better. We're learning together, and we appreciate everybody's patience. In how we've uh, kind of come along so far. And, oh my, maybe I did. Oh, I did miss a number of super chats. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Uh, 
really quick. I just want to make sure that I don't miss these. Subtracted said, oh, we got that one. Dust Knight, thanks for your super chat. So sorry I missed it. Just trying to keep uh, my attention just kind of split as I'm listening to both the speakers. Uh, it's always, I'm always looking at that Tom's chair and I'm thinking, oh, I wish I had a chair like that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the famous chair. Whenever we we had the live debate, the people said, "Why didn't you like bring Tom's chair, or put it on the plane, have it travel with him? You could put it on the stage, you could sit on it." So, just night, he says to the Christian, "I once observed a leaf land in a spot in the forest. Is it his contention that the leaf landed by design in that exact spot?" Actually, I would say yes. He would control every molecule, every proton, electron, you name it, in the universe. So, yes. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Next up, mm -hmm. Sijavrigo Saravia, thanks for your super chat. He said, why can't a theist call your argument, quote, evolution of the gaps? And the gaps mm -hmm. has the dollar Boom. sign for the S. I like that. He's got some swag. He says, versus God of the gaps. If you simply say there's, quote, other explanations in science, in give quotes. Um, well, I didn't say anything about evolution. This is about physics, but you couldn't say naturalism of the gaps because of induction. There's no such thing as naturalism of the gaps. It's just induction. If you say white goose, white goose, white goose, white goose, white goose, and there's a blank for what the next one is, it's reasonable to conclude the next one's going to be a white goose. So that's not a white goose of the gaps. That's just induction. But if you said the next one's going to be a black goose, something we've never seen before, and you discovered a white goose and said, well, no, the next one's going to be a black goose, and then we discovered another white goose, and the next one's going to be a black goose, that's a black goose of the gap. That's the god of the gap, because everything we discover is natural cause, natural cause, natural cause, natural cause throughout all of history. So it's reasonable to conclude the next one's going to be also a natural cause, which is not a naturalism of the gaps, it's induction. It's only a god of the gap, because we've never discovered a god explanation before in the past. Hey, hey, Tom, real quick. Uh, so are you saying that naturalism of, of the gaps is non-existent? I mean, it's not a thing. I'm just yeah, curious. It's, it's just induction. I mean, so you can, you can call it that if you want, but it's just induction. Thank you. Gotcha. Next up, we've had a couple of them. Thanks so much for your super chats, friends. Also, we've had Sigifrigos Rabia. Oh, we got that one. Subtracted asks, how can we tell that Yahweh created the universe? I'm assuming that's for me. Yes. Namely, how can we tell that Yahweh created the universe? Okay, so that, that's a, that's actually a very good question. Okay, so when we look at different forms of, uh, okay, let's say polytheism, we have deities that are parts of the physical elements themselves and which exist in an eternal universe. And so it's the three monotheistic faiths that state that the universe had a beginning. I'm not talking about the cosmos. We'll just say the universe. Uh, which, which is what we see. So we're left with Islam, Judaism, or Christianity. And Islam was written some 600 time, 600 years after the time of Jesus, borrows from a pre-existent religion of the Hebrew scriptures. So we're left with Judaism and, and Christianity. And I would say that true Judaism and Christianity were one and the same. Therefore, it would be the Judeo-Christian God of the Bible. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Next up, Edgar... Mm -hmm. Akira, thanks so much for your super chat. We appreciate that. And your question, which is, why does an omnipotent God need to fine-tune a universe that's over 99.999% unlivable? Well, okay, I would say that it shows an intentionality for life to be here. And, you know, what, what's interesting is I think in this instance, uh, theology would outweigh philosophy. For example, God would be under absolutely no obligation to answer uh, philosophical or personal objections like why this, why that. It is because that's the way he willed it. Gotcha. Thanks so much. With that, mm -hmm. appreciate everybody's questions. I hate wrapping up, but just respect the debaters. And as I mentioned, make it to a, a, an appointment that I was hoping to make before the end of the hour. We will wrap up and want to say thanks so much for being here, friends. Whether you be Christian, atheist, Republican, Democrat, Democrat, we are glad that you are here. It was not a Did you just say Democrat? <laughs> it was not a Freudian slip. Freudian slip, uh, buddy. Not a Freudian slip. Oh, man. 
I uh, I was actually for some reason I was thinking I was like should I mention libertarian and for some wait no it's not anything against libertarians either that we are glad to have you here no matter what your view is we hope that you enjoy these debates uh, we hope you feel welcome we uh, strive for that and we we strive to hopefully have fair debates so with that uh, really can't say thanks enough though to the debaters the debaters are the lifeblood of this channel I could not debate as often uh, like. Like and actually, like do anywhere near what the debaters do. If I try to do it, I don't know how Tom Jump does it. Tom Jump does, I think, but the the like the debates you see on Tom's channel, those are just the ones he records. That's only half. I mean, he does you know also another uh, debate each day just on his own that he doesn't even put online. So it's made I don't know, I made that up, but you never know. With that, I want to say thanks so much for being here. <laughs> Appreciate it. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. And oh, wait, sorry, forgive me. Tonight at 9.30 p.m., there's going to be a debate. Uh, Nephilim 3 was called out by Robert from Sentinel Apologetics. So Robert Ooh. is coming at him. And he's going to say, hey, Neph, you are so wrong. Christianity can Get him, Rob! <laughs> so he's going to say that Christianity can support aliens within its own worldview. It could, you could say, be theologically consistent, and we will have an atheist present who will be asking tough questions as the atheist interlocutor. So that will be a lot of fun. Thanks for being here, everybody, and we'll hopefully see you tonight at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. Take care.